Welcome to episode 79 of the Rex Chapman Show with my super dope homeboy from the Lex Town, Josh Hopkins. What up, Josh? What's happening, Rex Everett? How you doing? I see you're in uh, Brooklyn. I'm in Brooklyn. I see you're at Opie's. Yep, yep. My buddy yep. Opie's house. Yeah, yep. yeah. Some, some um, work being done. Yeah, I see coffee. A little, little Java back there in the back. Oh, yeah. Little coffee. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Nice. Tell mm-hmm. Opie nice kitchen for me. I will. When I will. Yeah. Um, it's episode 79, Josh. You know any famous 79s in the world of sports? I do not. This is where, for me to remember the code or whatever, I break it down, Michael, like Kenny Anderson, seven and I, nine. I might go, Michael Jordan in the Olympics was nine. Oh, so nice. That's probably 79. how I'd remember. Yeah. I, seven, I, don't, I don't know any 79s. Uh, seven, seven. Kenny Walker was seven after uh, he wore 34 at Kentucky. He was seven in the NBA. Uh, really? So I go, Kenny Walker. Nine Thunder Dan Marley. Thunder Dan Thunder Marley. Dan Marley. Thunder nine. Dan Marley. Nice. What about? Um, uh, well, you know, we do a segment called Book Club every week. Let let the uh, listeners know uh, what we're reading and what they should read. Did you read anything this week? No, I didn't. No. Nothing at all. Did you read anything? No, I didn't. Nothing. Been Nothing at club. all. Yeah, it's been book club. Um, all right. So, I want to talk to you, Josh, a little bit about the tournament. Uh, mm-hmm. the Virginia Cavaliers lost yesterday and yeah, I feel so, in just a heartbreaking fashion, uh, a Clark who has been a terrific point guard at Virginia for what seems like 12 years now. Uh, but I watched him play in California. Actually, he was a high school player and he goes to Virginia. So I've kind of kept up with him over the years. He just made a terrifically boneheaded play. They lose as a number two seed uh, to a 15 seed. Hartburg, right? Were you watching? Oh, yeah. That was, it's so March. Mm-hmm. So March. I mean, yeah. you think there's no way they could could lose that. And if people, people didn't see it. He got trapped in the corner. Yeah. How much time was left? Not like five like, seconds. Yeah. Five, and four, so three. He just did a heave. He, over yeah. tried and to go they, full court with it just to give it enough time I mean, no matter what he happened. had a guy he had and he had a, and he had a open. timeout that's why we love march madness and yes. and it's not it's not look i've said this for years nba basketball and college basketball may as well be two different sports so in the nba players are so good guys don't lose their mind that often Guys do lose their minds. They're young, young brains, haven't played enough basketball. You might have seven or eight guys at any time that might just kick it into the stands or forget the score or not know time and score. It's the intrigue that we like. It's the uh, the uncertainty of college basketball. And then the last thing is it's a one-game series. It's a one- Anybody can beat anybody one time out. So March Madness, baby, welcome. Yeah, it's right? fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, buddy, you want to get to our guest today? We have a terrific guest. Um, we we have a guy, a guy that coaches in the NCAA. We have former six-year NBA vet, Pac-10 Freshman of the Year, the nineteen ninety-six NCAA champion, Kentucky Wildcats. Our first Pope on the show. We have. Coach of the BYU Cougars, Mark Edward Pope. Welcome, Mark. Let's go. Thanks, Rex. Let's go. How are you, buddy? I'm doing so good, man. Super happy to see you. It's great. To Owner. See you. So, so I I, I got to tell you this. So, you know, Rex was long gone by the time that we rolled into uh, Kentucky when I was playing there, but uh, Rex and and Kenny. You know, some of you guys would come back in the summer. And to this day, in person, I have never seen a sweeter, more fluid jump shot in my life, ever. It is like the archetype of all jump shots. I mean, you were like the – I mean, talk about smooth. The only guy that I could could ever compare, and he he just didn't get high like you was – that made it look so easy was Dale Ellis. Dale Ellis, my my gosh, wow. but, but but you were you were jumping forty five inches in the air and delivering that shot. Made it look Art. so. Easy. I don't think I've ever seen. In fact, I'm gonna embarrass you right now. 
you know I'm a you know I'm a cycling fan. Yeah. And so pre um you know doping scandal, I was a huge Lance Armstrong fan. And his his former wife wrote an article, an op-ed one time, where she described watching him on a bike was like watching a dolphin uh, swimming in the ocean because it was just like where God made them to be. And I kid you not, Rex, watching you shoot jumpers felt exactly the same way. It was like God created this human being, this particular human being to come shoot jumpers, man. It was a thing of beauty. Mark. How about that for introduction? That is great. S- said so well because, uh, you know, I grew up idolizing them. I'm a Kentucky kid, too. And uh, it was just, I just like, so pretty. Just oh. so pretty. <laughs> oh, stop, stop. More, more, more. <laughs> Mark Pope, let's go back there. You're freshman of the year uh, out west, and you show up. Just show up one day. I've never heard of you before. I'd watched you play. I'd watched you play in college. I think you said it right, Kenny Walker and Jamal Mashburn and I would come back and we'd try to beat up on the younger guys. All you guys were pros. You just weren't pros yet. And it was great for us. I know it was great for you. But when you showed up at UK playing for Rick Pitino, that first, very first experience, and you stepped out there with not only us, but, you know, a bunch of McDonald's All-Americans on those Kentucky teams. I think, I think like nine there? nine pros on that team, eight or nine. So what was that like? Yeah. Well, the, the first thing that crossed my mind was I am not a good basketball player. <laughs> I thought the same thing my first day on campus. Too. I swear I did. But um, I, I kind of knew what I was I was walking into uh, in some ways. In some ways I didn't. But um. You know, I had played two years of college basketball for a bad team. We were a bad team. We just couldn't win. In fact, the reason I transferred was because my coach got fired, which was super hard because, you know, I loved him dearly. And you want to win for your coach. And I just couldn't do it, man. I I just, man, it was devastating. Um, And and, but the the gift that I had was um, I went from a bad program to the best program in the country and guys coming in as a freshman don't really ever understand what they have because they haven't seen anything else. Yeah. Um, so the thing that one of the things that was super striking to me, Rex, you'll totally be able to relate to this, is you know, I was at Washington where, you know, I would I would get in the gym extra and I would stay after and guys would kind of walk by and almost ridicule you because they're like, man, you just, you know, stop trying to do this or that or whatever. So I'm like my second week in the summer at Kentucky. I've just got there in the summer session. You know, we're playing every day, playing pickup every day. You guys come in, we play. And so I'm like, all right, I got a lot of work to do. I'm going to put in some extra time so I can catch up. So I I kid you not, it must have been 1130 or midnight. And we, you know, we always had the the Memorial Coliseum Mm gym so we could we could sneak in there. And so I go in and I'm like, I'm going to just quietly go over there. Shep was my roommate. I kind of left him. You know, I'm just like, I'm going to go over by myself and get, get, get some, some extra work. I walk into the gym. There's like five dudes in there already in a full sweat. And I was like, where am I? <laughs> Everybody was so hungry. And that's actually, for me, that's what made it heaven was everybody in there was fighting so hard, doing everything they could to grow it, it was it was bliss, man. Just being think in that about that though. Think about that, Mark. Not everybody wants that. Not yeah. everybody wants to go in there and and be humbled. Uh, come mm-hmm. in, start from scratch. You'd already been player of the year and as a freshman out west. You're coming yeah. in. You're starting right right from scratch. Knowing you like I know you now, you know the on court, the off court. That was part of who you are. It's in your DNA. Yeah, I would I would wish that, you know, it's it, it you know I wish I would wish every college basketball player could experience that because it just is like it is, you know, we, we spend our whole lives chasing this game and searching, and then you just get this opportunity to be with like-minded people that are that actually are putting their whole it, it just is super special because you don't get that very many places and in very many times. It was it was really beautiful. 
Well, you're so accomplished in so many ways and you don't, you don't get that way without being a grinder and a worker. And we've had Shep on here. We've had Mash. We've had a lot of these guys and all of them tell stories about uh, with Rick being like who we had on the show, uh, Rick being like, I, I'm quitting. I'm going to quit. This is, this is ridiculous. And you're just a worker. Was there ever a time when you were like, I, this is crazy that what was it like? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was really my experience with the whole thing. I mean, kind of along the same lines is like, I had always outworked everybody mm-hmm. and it always, it always, you know, it was always hard, but it was like, yeah, that's my, that was my MO. It's like, Hey, you might be better than me. I'm just going to outwork you. I'm going to outwork you in the summer. I'm going to work you out in practice. I'm going to work outwork you in the game. I'm going to just outwork you. And, um, and then I got to Kentucky and I'm like, man, it's not easy to outwork anybody. Like it, all of a sudden it's like, I don't know if I can outwork anybody. Like that was, su- it was super humbling. And coach was the ringleader. Like coach was, and, and coach, coach did it also not just outwork you, but coach was going to out intensify yeah. you. I don't think that's a real word, but he was going to out intensify you every single second of every single day. And he was going to challenge you to be in the intensifying game and see if you could live in that space. And, um, you know, he, he was, he was, he was the catalyst and the ringleader and he's the one that developed that environment. And it was, it was really special to be able to play for him. And, 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 you know, like, like, you know, like everybody talks about, you were fighting just to survive. Like you had to, you had to fight to survive. I'll never forget. Uh, it was my junior year. And, you know, the worst time of the year was when we went to uh winter break, we, we got out of class because then two days are gone. There's no class. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the 20 hour rule for whatever that was worth right. was gone. <laughs> and, and, there was no, there was no time. Limits. And in my memory, it was like six weeks long. It was probably only three weeks long, but it seemed like it was years long. Like we were so happy when class started back up, but coach was so mad at us on the front line that, you know, we always did two a days. We do two a days every day. And he started making the post come back and do three a day. So we would come back We'd go really hard at like 10 a.m. Then we go at four, and then we would come back at 10:30 p.m. And if you, if you Rex, you're gonna appreciate this. And we would just play one on one in the post with the coaches screaming at us the whole time. And you know how nasty and ugly. Oh, that I gets. remember. It was. I mean, brutal. Like you can't hardly move. You're week three of two a days in the middle of the season, and like, and then you're just. You're just so angry. All you're doing is punching and elbowing. So we're in there playing, and you can't hardly move it. And Walter McCarty gets so pissed at me. He just gets me with a – he gets me with an elbow right to the mouth so hard that my lip, like my insides were sticking through my lip, right? <laughs> and I, Rex, I don't know if you ever got to go fast. This. You, you oh, go yeah. fast. <laughs> So fast, Eddie comes running out of the court. He races me up to the OR, and him and the doc with their hands are trying to pull my lip back off my tooth. Oh my god! But that—that oh. that was just it. That was like that was every single day. It was yeah, just man. Days. I remember. I remember during that time, Nazi. Nazi was on campus, right? <laughs> Wasn't Nazi there? And Rick yeah. was, you know, Rick was having a tough time with Nazi, not a tough time. Nas wouldn't do anything, but he was way overweight and all that. And he'd been, you know, losing weight alongside you guys, trying his hardest to keep up with you guys, all that stuff. But he turned his ankle. I come in the next day to lift. You guys are out on the court. Nazi is in on the bike. Rick had taped his foot to feet to the bicycle and brought him all his meals for like two days in a row. So Nazi, man, I could tell Nazi stories for days, right? So it was the spring. Season was over. I can't remember if we had just won the national championship, but I think we had. Or maybe it was maybe it was the year before, but that Nazi, maybe it was a Nazi first got there. But do you remember the weight room in Mora Coliseum? And then if you keep walking down the hall, there was a storage room to the left. And it was just like, it was, it was hot. It was not air conditioned. It was just oh, full yeah. of junk. And so I'm walking down there and I see the door open. It's late. It's like 11 o'clock at night, right? I'm walking down there 
and I hear something in there and I walk in, it's like a hundred degrees in there and Nazi is in there by himself. Coaches put a Stairmaster in that room. It's like a sauna oh, and oh Nazi is God. on the Stairmaster literally like if there were it, it was either sweat running in his eyes or it was tears coming out of his eyes but like he was trying so desperately to make weight for tomorrow morning because if he didn't he knew what was going to happen to him and th that young man yes. accepted so much torture and this is the story we all have to tell about coach p because he lived through unbearable torture and all it did was change him so he could play 19 years in the league. 19 what? years. And a, and probably made $100 million playing and was not a starter. Was and, not and a now, starter. And now he's going to be, now he's, you know, he's working his way up to be a GM. Like, yeah, he's in the front office. It's, and it's a success. Co Coach, Coach P changed every single one of our lives that way. And it's, it's, it's super special, man. How, how does uh what have you taken uh from only well let's start with off uh what have you taken from coach um when life's hard we've all been through our stuff he's, he's had his ups and downs what did you get from him watching him all those days as a player what did you take away as a person and and how have you i guess folded that into your coaching style or not yes so um i think coach had so many incredible gifts um um, and he, he just keeps winning, man. Like I've never seen anything like it. This dude, this dude, if he, if he was in the Lexington and police league, he would be back to back city champs. I mean, it doesn't matter where <laughs> you put him. He's going to win. It's crazy. Yeah. But a couple of things, a couple of things I take from coach, um, you know, when I talk about his intensifying, right, he's going to, he's going to challenge you with intensity. Um, you know, his his relentless intensity, like it never turns off and it is exhausting and debilitating to everybody around him. And so he actually filters out. He filters out all the pretenders super fast, man. Mm -hmm. And um, and then he'll take the guys that are going to hang in there and he'll push them to a place that they never could have got on their own. And they come out. uh you know, you spend a lot of time broken and then you come out uh, built different. You come out of his deal built different, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, his intensity, I think, is incredibly special. And then the other, th the other thing that Coach does that is just incredible, and it's partly, it's partly born from the intensity, but he just creates his own reality around his team. Yeah. Like, yeah. like. You could you could be sitting in the office and there could be a window to the outside and it could be eight degrees and sunny. And coach would be like, it's effing snowing out there. It is snowing. And you the thing is, you never you always know you're like, no, I'm looking outside and it's actually sunny and 80. But because of his relentless nature, at some point you just relent and be like, whatever, man. I guess it's, it's snowing. snowing. And you go with it. <laughs> And it's nonstop. And so he creates this bubble around his team that is so incredible. And, and everybody knows it's not real, but she's just like, you know what? I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it's real. Maybe I'm seeing things wrong. And it is, it, I think it's his greatest gift. I think it's an incredible man. His force of nature, the way he leads yeah. is, is, is incredible. Mark, how do you, how do you, that intensity and that push and putting kids in a blender and changing them. How do you apply that now to a completely different time in society? You know, it's, you can't just go in and military talk to these kids. They'll break. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's what we're all searching for. Right. I mean, it's, it's pretty fun because from my team, there's so many guys in the coaching field and we're all just trying to search for coaches magic. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and the magic we got to experience together. Uh, I, I do think it's different. I, I'll never forget when I, I was, uh, I think I was, I can't remember if I was still playing or maybe I was in, maybe I was back in school at the time, but I went and watched coach uh, when he was at Louisville. I went, went to a game at UConn and I sat with coach for a while after and coach was kind of shaking his head and he was just like, oh man, you know, he didn't say I'm so soft. He would never say those words, but he he just was like, Hey, I can't coach these guys like I like I coach you guys. You just can't do it anymore. 
So, you know, we can't do it exactly like yeah. we learned from him for sure. It just can't exist. It can't right. exist today. But with that said, uh, he has still found a way to coalesce his teams in an incredible way. Uh, yeah. Everywhere. It doesn't matter if it's in Greece or Iona or Louisville or wherever. And so it, it can still be done, but it certainly has to be done different. You know, I can't believe, you know, you said you felt like you weren't a great basketball player when you got to Kentucky. At some point you had to realize you were a great basketball player to be fitting in and playing with these guys. And I just remember thinking, how did we get Mark Pope all the way over to Lexington and if there was, if we could have grown a player in a lab to join and be with that team, it would have been Mark Pope yes. for a myriad of reasons. Yep. I mean, did you realize that when you came that you were going to be like a missing piece to something great? Were you sold on that? You know what I love about time is that we all become so much better players every year. <laughs> after we, retire. we just become better and better. Here's the I haven't missed I haven't missed a shot in 20 years. <laughs> I'm gonna give you the facts, okay? So the fact is that Coach Patino um, recruited me out of high school, straight out of high school. Came to my home, spent time recruiting me. Uh, kind of dug in and um, was super like Coach always is. Was brutally honest with me. Herb Sendek was actually the lead recruiter. I love Herb so much. He's yeah, actually in my too. league now, so I. I get to, or I have the last few years, got to play against him. He's one of the great human beings on the planet. And so um, Coach P recruited me. Like he, 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 he recruited me the way he does. He didn't recruit me like he recruits most of his guys. He made a stop by the house and talked. And when my dad asked him, you know, he said, you know, I know you guys are recruiting Chris Weber. Um, you know, if Chris Weber comes, what do you do? He's like, if Chris comes, I'm not talking to you guys anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, 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 which of course is the right. That's the truth. Yeah. And, uh, and so I ended up, you know, I, I ended up staying home thinking, man, I, I want to take on this challenge to try and turn around Washington basketball and see what we do. And two years later, I totally failed. I got my coach fired was the only thing I accomplished. <laughs> uh, sadly. And, um, and so then you know, I am thrown back into this fire, this, you know, this transfer was way different then, right? It was way different. And I was getting crushed and watching for leaving, but I just couldn't, I, I couldn't stay without coach there. And, and so um, we, we, you know, I, Lynn Nance, who was my coach at um, Washington had been an assistant at University of Kentucky. And so you know, when he got fired and then I told him I was leaving, he started telling me stories about it. He's like, Mark, you don't understand. This place is like, if you can go, you got to go. And so I actually think Coach Nance called, uh, called, you know, his people can tell He's like, hey, you got to take another look at, at Mark. And so I don't think I ever talked to Coach P. At wow. the time, it was Billy Donovan. And Coach P was like, right. I'm not talking to that dude, man. He didn't come the first time. I'm not wasting one second on him. In fact, I think when I actually showed up on campus, Coach P was a little dis disappointed. He's like, oh, we got to take this cat, man. Let's go, <laughs> you know. And so um, from day one, but but that's what I wanted to get to, too. Like, I had I had, had some, some individual success in college and hadn't won and had played at a, you know, in the in the Pac-12, Pac but, you know, not a level of the SEC or Kentucky at the time. I mean, that – league was crazy yeah and i just wanted to go test myself against the best players in in, in college basketball and so that that was i knew going in what a challenge was gonna be and i couldn't wait like that's what i wanted so coach your your, your size was so good man your size your toughness you know yeah. you're the nicest guy in the world but not on the floor you know to you you're competing what i want to know is do your players know you were such a great player <laughs> my players know I was. <laughs> yeah my, <laughs> my players uh you know they, they they have some vague notion that i played right okay and um <laughs> and that's, that, that's the way it should be listen the yeah. last thing my players want to hear is some glorified old story about me playing <laughs> right? they don't want to hear that no. oh, i man. imagine well, when you got to lexington i mean with those 
you all are brothers now. You've been through the fire with Rick and won it all. But some of those guys weren't the most welcoming. I, and I, 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 in my mind, I think Antoine Walker might not have been the most welcoming guy. But <laughs> what was that experience like when you walked on? Yeah, you know, it was so it was actually so incredible because you get tested every day. Like and and so and and the beautiful thing about that, that I think is just it was it was it was kind of everywhere at the time. But the beautiful thing about that is you come and get tested and you're testing yourself and then you have to fight and scratch and claw to actually eventually earn your place. And and I wish everybody could have that experience because it's terrifying yeah. and it's scary and it's demoralizing. You got to fight through it, and then and then when you get there, it changes you. You walk around different. You see the world different. You're like, I can do things that I didn't know I could do, and and that's the gift of sports, right? And so, for me to be able to roll into Kentucky and have all the guys looking at me sideways and coach being pissed that I. You know, Don, Billy, what is wrong with you? Did you actually brought this kid in here and then, and then fight through it all and earn your space? Whatever little niche it is, like that's, I mean, it does. It changes you as a human being, man. And that's why I love sports so much because you get a chance to, to you get a chance to be changed. It's pretty great. Yeah, man. I that Speaking of Antoine, that's one of my favorite, you know, stories about him coming in there like his first day I remember and it was the summer he's he's heavy heavier at that time the draft happened months ago this is the summertime and we're it's his first day out there I'm sure Mark was out there myself Kenny Walker and Antoine somehow the 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 conversation before a game turns to the uh big dog Glenn Robinson had gone number one in the draft and Antoine said oh big dog left right and we all went, yeah. And he said, so player of the year is up for grabs, huh? And he hasn't played a second at Kentucky. He hasn't practiced for Rick Pitino, nothing. And then he goes, the bench, remember that? Coming off the bench, can't. He wasn't going to start. He had to earn it. He got broken down from that day, broken down to nothing, where he questioned whether he could play anywhere. It happens to everybody. And then look at him. Rick molded him into what he became, and he became. NBA. Yeah, but what would happen? What would happen today? He's got options. He doesn't have to fight through it. He can be like, "I'm going to go over here with, mm. you know, I don't have to sit out of here like Mark Pope." You know, if these kids like, you know, there's a lot of good with NIL, and there's a lot of tough stuff as it evolves. Mm. I I saw you, Mark, where you said uh, that. You all at BYU as a school need to step up uh, and uh, get on the cutting edge of the NIL, or you're gonna you're losing players. What does that mean? Well, uh, you know, D B BYU is an incredibly special place, and it's a different place. We kind of work by a different standard, and and mm -hmm. uh, we kind of see the world a different way, which which I think is is. Um, it has been uh, over the last few years and will be in the future will be a reason why we continue to be more and more successful. Um, and, and so, you know, you, 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 you hear all these horror stories about NIL um, where it just becomes this, uh, this, this just cash transaction mm -hmm. that doesn't have a lot of life and meaningless and 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 actually uh you know you hear about guys not getting what they were promised and right. or, or people that delivered on what was promised uh, and then the kids hurt and he's not playing and them going sideways and it just turns into a very um you know it turns into like a bad contract at least in the nba the contracts have to be honored rex actually I, I, you know, I played a couple of years overseas. It actually turns into like overseas in the late nineties where you were fighting paycheck to paycheck and you never knew if they were going to pay you and you have to fight them. If and you whatever. got hurt, if you got hurt, they'll find somebody else and send you home. Exactly. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about, man. And so it turns into this thing and, and um, you know, we'll see who knows what it's going to become, but we're trying to find, we're trying to do this where we find more heart and meat to what NIL is supposed to mean. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, you know, through NIL, we've been able to set up uh, foundations, 501s for three of our players 
uh, one of our players is in the process of of building a one point five million dollar um, youth center in Bamako, Mali, that will be the first building of its kind in the country. Um, and so, and I was allowed to do that. And he's and it's where he's from, and he is. Uh, we went back last fall and met with um, some of the highest ranking government officials in a in a mind you a government that's taken over through a coup. So it's not like a, it's not like things are super stable, right. but to watch Fus Traore, one of our players, one of our, be, uh, you know, our star players to watch him uh, go from the first meeting where he was reserved to the fifth meeting in 48 hours, where he was actually running the table with some of the highest ranking officials in the country. Now we're talking about NIL guys, because he is yeah. building relationships and putting himself himself in a place where he can actually go be a leader in the country. Yeah. And and so we have a you know we have a lot of stories like that where I think we're finding the heart of NIL where certainly our guys are are getting taken care of in necessary ways right now but they're doing something with this that is 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 making an impact on the world in a significant way and and so you know that's that's the that's the direction we're pointing. We'll see how well it works, but in the meantime, it's going to make a difference, and that's that's pretty good in and of itself. I love that stuff. You know, I think that's the key. You know, I think uh, a lot of the NIL stuff, you know, give back to the community. Uh, the more that that college athletes on campus, if they're if they're benefiting from NIL, the more that they can give back to the community, the better. And the other thing I love about it, Mark. You, Walter McCarty, Tony Delk, all those Kentucky guys, you were going to go on and make money playing. And what I like about the NIL are the guys like Cameron Mills, who played at Kentucky for four years. And that's his professional <laughs> experience. And guess what? He should have been compensated something. I'd like for him to be able to knock out, you know, a half million dollars in four years or whatever that number is. I hope it takes care of guys that aren't going to go on and play professionally. Well, you know, Rex, uh, you know, we have another player, Spencer Johnson, who is a who will be a super senior next year, a terrific basketball player, had a great year for us. And he is just finishing up his realtor's license. And so what NIL allows him to do right now for the next year, this summer and next year is it allows him to put his name to private and commercial real estate deals where he's wow. actually not just going to earn some money, but he's going to build a career while he's playing. And wow. so the value of that is so much more than someone handed you a hundred thousand dollar check. It's just so much more. It's a life changing opportunity. And it's way different than if he was going to start the year after he finished yes. playing. No mm -hmm. question. He's real. He's so much from all of that. So right. yeah, I, I do think, you know, hopefully, you know, is, is a, is a, is a society of college basketball. Hopefully, um, we clearly there's the, the cash transactions are fine and they could be life changing for guys, at least at least in the short term. But the NIL gives such a bigger opportunity to change yeah. the whole trajectory of your life than just to get a just get a check. You know, Mark, I know we can't keep you too long, but I have to ask this because it, it jumped off the page. Uh, reading about you. I mean, you're so accomplished in so many ways and a road Scholar candidate and then a national champion, you played in the NBA. Uh, and then and then after your basketball, NBA basketball, or your, your professional career, you went over, you got into med school at Columbia and Dr. Pope was, was, and at some point, I don't know if you were like, I can't, this is gross. Or if you were like, I just miss basketball. Was there a moment where you're like, I'm done here. I have to go back to basketball. Yeah, I had my first midlife crisis. So I sad <laughs> to say, guys. Uh, in fact, my my mother in law still barely will speak to me. You know, she was she her daughter married a you know just this 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 kind of like you know, professional basketball player, like just throw him in the trash. Right. And then everything changed when he was going to be a doctor. She was like, my son-in-law, the doctor. <laughs> and then I dropped out and like, she's just like, she's done. It's over. Like we have no relationship whatsoever. She will not talk to me. So it was, um, you know, 
there, there were a lot of there were a lot of reasons. I was just starting my fourth year of medical school, so t- tell me how smart that is, right? <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I had gotten far enough down the road where I was like, ah, I just don't know if you know. I just could sense that my passion was not equaling the passion of these incredible students that I was around, and and I was just like, you know, I had been blessed at that point where I had some. You know, I wasn't stuck. I had some a little bit of financial freedom and a little bit of experience of freedom. And, and so, I mean, my, you know, Leanne, my 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 wife is the most incredible person in the world. And and so we began talking about it and made a really hard decision. But she was all in. She's like, let's go. So I moved to, in fact, went in, uh, talked to the dean, and she she was convinced I was on drugs. Nobody leaves Columbia Medical School. You don't like it's it's one of the greatest and institutions. Four, in the world. Fourth year, yes. And mind you, I still had seven years left in internship and residency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but but um, but I got in the car and drove to Georgia, and and Rex a little bit like talking about your jumper, right? Um, I got to Georgia with Coach Fox. And um, I I drove all night and that morning they were starting an elite camp. And so I got on the court and was just kind of yelling and screaming a little bit and just had a moment where I was like, you know what, I might not be very very good at this, but there's a good chance that God put me on this earth to to, to enjoy doing this and and to to, to take a shot at at doing this. And and we never looked back since. We've been really, really blessed. So blessed. Oh, man. You've just felt it. You could feel it when you there. I love that, man. Hey, uh, let's talk about uh, the tournament a little bit. You had uh, Gonzaga nearly beaten back in January. They made a late comeback, uh, defensive stop in the final moments. What can you say about the job Mark Few's done with this senior class, Anton Watson, Sear Bolton, Drew Timmy? It's, um, I, I mean, you know, the thing about what Few has done over the last 20 years is just breathtaking. It just, it, I, I don't know if there's an equal, guys. I mean, this is a tiny little school out in the middle of nowhere. Like, this is not Villanova, a smallish school in Philadelphia. Right. I mean, this is like on the the suburbs, if there is such a thing, of Spokane, Washington. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, with I don't know three thousand students, and and yeah. um, you know, when it's it's really been incredible to watch these guys, but just the way he just. Uh, runs us back year after year after year and makes it look so easy. And, um, you know, he do you talk about a guy that approaches this in some ways exactly the opposite of Coach Patino, exactly the opposite in so many ways. But at the heart of it, man, those two guys are winners. And uh, I, I can't say enough about Coach Few. And, and also with Coach Few, like he's been – he is one of the kindest and most generous. He's been incredible – incredibly generous mentor to me he's a he's a really special human being man wow talk to me about saint mary's a little bit yeah and, and randy bennett. yeah we'll randy bennett is something else it was randy so my deal was randy but i say this all the time he could come here uh the day of the game come to the Marriott center you know we have you know we we have eighteen thousand in this in this arena every night yeah. he could come here at 10 a.m he could go to our rec center and pick out five random students and probably walk in the gym and beat me. This guy's incredible. It's incredible. <laughs> he's incredible. I'm he with is. you. I'm with you. Who, who you who do who, what are some of the teams you think got a real shot this year to to cut them down? Oh my gosh, guys. You guys can know that better than I am. Can I be honest with you? I haven't yeah. watched a full game yet. Like I bet you hadn't. We, we 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 did not have our best year this year. We we're super young and we, we like if you look at my desk right now, it is, uh, you know, like we're, I'm super selfish that way. I'm actually 100 percent worried about us getting better. And so I'm I'm not really dialed in. I do know Arizona yeah. took one uh, yesterday. Uh, I'm sure people were, were were surprised about that, but I have no idea. What I find uh, out is coach. Yeah. Coaches, head coaches, especially almost never know what's going on outside because you're so focused on the next game. you got to sit game film for the next yeah. game uh you guys are pretty tuned out and if you do know a lot about what's going on you're probably not too tuned into your own team <laughs> i am i am picking the wildcats over providence today for sure okay all right good 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 uh mark favorite movie of all time um 
Life is beautiful. Easy. Fantastic. Never had that one. That's we great. We haven't had that one. Perfect. Have you guys have you guys seen it? You guys may not have seen it. Yeah, oh yeah, I've seen it. I haven't. It's just amazing. It is, What's his it, name? You need to do yourself. You want to talk about you want to talk about heroism in a place where there is no Oh heroism. no, I saw that. Roberto yeah. Benigni. Yeah, yeah. Right? it is. Yes. Yeah. That is beautiful. Talk about that. He is he is he is, I mean he is like hope you know bringing hope to a place where hope can't exist. I, I just this character Same. Yeah. Oh my gosh, she's incredible. Rebound. I love to see what that kid looks like now, where he is. I would too. He was so I great in that. Those big eyes. Yeah. Yeah, it was oh fantastic. My God. Such great an inspiring. Call, Mark. Hey, Mark, what um if you could sit front row center for any entertainer, speaker, band, anyone, dead or alive, front row center. Well, I, this is not going to be super sexy. I'm a I'm a huge, huge Malcolm Gladwell fan. Um, I think the way that's that, sexy. I think the way that, yeah, maybe that is. Yeah, I love know. that. Malcolm would be super hyped that you said his name and sexy in the same sentence. I think, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you no, know, I, I, I love the way that he, um, I love the way that he kind of can turn uh, notions we take for granted inside out and help us rethink. I think it's just uh, I, I just like I like learning to think that way. So you know I, I'm a big fan of his right now. Yeah, I could listen to him speak for hours. He's he's endlessly fascinating. You're right. Great call, Mark Pope. Thank you so much for doing this, buddy. Uh, best of luck. You're a superstar. Can't thank you enough for taking time out to join us. Hey, you know Rex. I mean, you were in the middle of your NBA career. But man, you were super generous to us. Oh. Like I'll always love you for that. You were you were super generous to us. So uh, appreciate being on. Be good, guys. Thanks, buddy. Be well. Love. Thanks so much, yeah. man. Well, and that's gosh. been another episode of Between, Between Two, two Turds. <laughs> God, that guy. Gosh, road scholar. Uh, I mean, he's just magnificent, right? Right. What do you think the latest he's ever slept in is? I bet he's, I bet he's lounged around till four a.m. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that guy, those jeez, <laughs> man. I mean, to tell then, you, then he um, went to four years of med school at Columbia and then quit, and then and <laughs> because and he then wanted didn't to be really a feel it was scratching the itch. Amazing. I have to tell you, what a great guy. I mean, yeah. just uh, one of those guys, though. He's in. He's like in that mood all the time. Same, same, same guy every day, all the time. Yeah. You know, when so when something happens in my world to me, I can just melt down and start crying. Uh, emotional frail. <laughs> yeah. Mark Pope is one of those guys that you can go to about problems of your own. He can talk plainly about his own problems and in an analytical way and decide and kind of shoo out the emotion of it. He's just a special human being. Special. Yeah. Yeah, he is. I enjoyed that. That was our first Pope, by the way. Yeah, that was. That's a big, big, big accomplishment. We should have gone in. And, uh, how, uh, yeah, how does the Pope end up at BYU? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tackle that next time. All right, Josh, that's been episode uh, 79. Want to do it again next week? I would. I would, Rex. Let's do it. For Rex Chapman and Josh Hawkins, this has been the Rex Chapman Show. Join us here next week, same time, same place, right here on basketballnews.com.